All right, welcome everybody. It's so good to see you all. Thanks for joining uh, Matt Howitt Holmes program today with Richard Hart. Such an honor to have you again, Richard, um, teaching us so much about what's happening in the land of uh, legal disputes with our indigenous tribes working to uh, fight for their their rights. So I'm going to let you go ahead and finish introducing yourself. And without any further ado, thanks for being here. Okay, thank you, Tracy. So I have a lot of ground to cover today. So I'll, I'll be brief in my introduction. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a historian, ethno historian, I've worked on tribal as an expert witness. I'm not an attorney. I've worked as an expert witness uh, for about the past 50 years, since the 1960s. And so, and this is the, the very first case that I worked on was involved the Zunis, the Zuni Pueblo. <clears throat> so I'll back up a little bit and say the main, the policy of the United States through the late 19th century and the early 20th century was of assimilation. The idea was that if they could teach, uh, if white people could teach Indians to be Christians and to wear white clothes and live in white white houses, that eventually they would assimilate with the rest of the population and we wouldn't need to worry about reservations and tribes anymore. Uh, that didn't work out too well. The tribes tended to stay as tribes and didn't assimilate no matter what the uh, kind of policy or methods, the strategies the government used to force them to assimilate. So, in the early 20th century, many tribes, uh, California tribes, and all over the United States, tribes sued the United States for lands taken without payment or without proper compensation. And at the same time, in the early 20th century, especially in the 30s and 40s, there was a movement to, ter to simply terminate tribes. The idea being that tri the assimilation had been unsuccessful. And so the special rights, the reservations, the special treaty rights, all these rights should be just terminated by the United States and Indians should deal with that however they might deal with it. As a result, in the 1940s, these two sides agreed that there needed to be a lawsuit. Either, which, either way the policy went, there needed to be the potential for tribes to sue the United States. And so a guy who was really well, well known as an attorney, as an advocate for, for tribes by the name of Felix Cohen wrote an act called the Indian Claims Commission Act and it was passed in 1946. And that act allowed every tribe in the United States to sue the United States uh, it was a jurisdictional act, so it allowed tribes to sue the United States for lands taken without proper compensation. Uh, so that was passed in 1946. It had a five-year statute. The Originally, it had a five-year statute of limitations, so tribes had five years to file their claim. So I had been working in 1968. I had been working for the Zuni Pueblo uh, for a while, I had written some curricular materials for them uh, that they used in their schools. I think they were their idea was mainly to educate the teachers. Uh, and so they asked me down that year, and they, we had a big meeting with the council, and they said, we have two questions for you. One, none of the council spoke English. English was a second language for everybody on the reservation, and most people didn't have a second language. Most people just spoke Zuni at that time, which is a separate language group. Uh, so we had this meeting, and the, the council asked me, they said, we have two questions for you. One, did the Zuni tribe have a claim against the United States under the Indian Claims Commission? And if so, why didn't we file it before the statute of limitations ran? And they said, we'd like to hire you. <clears throat> they had the first, they had just sold the right of way for a power transmission line from the Four Corners power plant. And so they had the first disposable income they'd ever had of any significant amount. It wasn't all that significant. 
I didn't make very much money. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I agreed to do that for a year and eventually wrote a couple of reports, uh, one big one that was submitted to Congress. And eventually in 1974, a big portion of that was published in the congressional record. And then and finally in 1976, uh, eight years after I started on this project, Congress passed a jurisdictional act allowing the Zunis to sue for uh, compensation for lands taken without payment or without proper payment. So uh, I started working then on my uh, expert testimony. Eventually in the early 1980s, we went to court and eventually in uh, 1990, we settled the cases. In the meantime, uh, I said cases, and that's because in the meantime, somewhere along the line, I realized that the Jurisdictional Act allowed for suing for damages to existing lands. And so we filed a second land claim against the United States for acts or omissions, that is, things they did or things that they should have done but didn't do. And this was for the damage to the trust lands, the, the reservation lands. And what had happened was the United States had established a military fort in the Zuni Mountains just above the reservation. And the military officers who ran that fort uh, had first signed contracts to clear cut the whole mountainside and they didn't leave any seed trees. Today, of course, even when there is a clear cutting, they do leave seed trees. And then after clear cutting the mountainside, they ran herds of cattle over it. And after that, herds of sheep. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there was an episode of erosion on the reservation. Every stream bed on the re reservation was eroded down 30, 40 feet. It was a terrible episode and it destroyed all of the agricultural land. They had 10,000 acres of for corn in 1850. Uh, by 1906, they had zero acres of corn. So we filed a second lawsuit, <clears throat> which was immediately opposed by the uh, the same people that became climate change deniers who claimed this was in fact an act of God and just a normal climate change uh, that, that would have happened no matter what the United States did or didn't do. And uh, interestingly, I'll just get into that case a little bit first. Interestingly, what I did was I hired uh, the two pr most prominent uh, climatologists, endroclimatologists, dendroclimatologists, so that they study the climate change on the basis of tree, root, tree rings. And these were people who had said there was a natural cycle of erosion which occurred in the Southwest as a result of climate change. And so I asked them to look at this, to not worry about the general conclusions, but to just look at this local area and determine if this was the result of natural climate change or the result of human activity. <clears throat> and they, uh, it was a bit of a gamble, I must admit, but they did agree that it was not as a result of climate change, but as a result of the human activity in the, <laughs> the uh, clear cutting over grazing. Uh, there was a little bit of mining, but that didn't have a lot to do with it. So by 1990, we had these two, we had tried the first case and the court had determined that the tribe had lost some 12 million acres of land. Uh, the way these cases worked, they were bifurcated. Uh, so you had, two, you had two parts. The first part was the determination of the amount of land that was taken, the boundaries of that land. And the second part uh, was on the, was to determine the second the bifurc the second portion of the case would determine the value of the land at the time it was taken. So if the land was taken in 1850, for instance, the value of uh, semi-arid land in the Southwest might be 10 cents an acre. Uh, 
And that was what they, the United States paid. There was no interest. And the reason they argued that was that they said that tribes didn't have real title. They only had Aboriginal title. And Aboriginal title was like a use right. So it's good that uh, the United States recognized Aboriginal title, but it was too bad that it didn't realize, it didn't recognize that that was the same as real title. So what we did is we actually appealed that decision in, in, in regard to the Zuni's case only and said that uh, Mexico and Spain had recognized the actual t border uh, line of the Zuni Pueblo of its territory and therefore it was a recognized title. Uh, and we provided uh, evidence of Spain and Mexico uh, showing those the borders of the of Zuni territory. The Spain and Mexico both that looked at the Pueblos, especially the Western Pueblos, Zuni Hopi and Acoma and Laguna, <clears throat> looked at those Pueblos as allies against the Navajos and the Apaches. They viewed the Navajos and the Apaches as enemies. And so they actually armed Zuni. They provided Zuni with guns and allowed Zuni to have horses. And Zuni had a, a mounted armed militia of about 500 people, which was a larger militia than any of the Navajo bands could put together. Navajo didn't have a central organization. And so the organization of Zuni was extremely valuable to Spain. And that's one of the reasons why they recognized their boundaries. However, the federal court wouldn't agree with us. They didn't agree that, that Spain and Mexico's recognition of those boundaries constituted real title in spite of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which should have guaranteed that. And so we had to settle on the idea of getting land, getting value at the value of the land at the time it was taken. Now, what <clears throat> the experts in previous cases, all the, most of the tribes filed lawsuits between 1946 and 1951, most of the tribes in the United States. And uh, what they usually did was determine an average time of taking. So they would say, well, the average lands were taken between 1846 and 1900, so we'll average it out and say they were taken in 1876. And so the value of lands in 1876 was 25 cents an acre, and that's what we'll get. What we did is uh, I constructed a map showing the exact time when I thought each parcel of land was taken. And some of these uh, we were able to show the United States had not. Uh, shown any title to the land until the 1940s, uh, until the 1930s. Uh, and so we had a map with uh, that showed all the various different parcels at the various different times of taking and uh, were able to get a much larger total that we thought was owed to the tribes. Uh, we estimated that if you accepted everything we said, the value of the land would have been a hundred million dollars or something. It's still nothing like, of course, what it would be valued in, in real terms if it was real title. The second case, in the meantime, uh, we uh, were attempting to value what agricultural land was worth on the trust lands, the lands in the reservation. And uh, we ended up saying that uh, if you, really looked at the value of those lands to 10,000 acres and the value of agricultural land, irrigated agricultural land because it was irrigated, uh, that you were looking at many millions of dollars and that the erosion, to repair the erosion would cost tens and ten, actually hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, eventually the United States, the Department of Justice and the United States decided that they wanted what they called a global settlement. They wanted a settlement of both cases at the same time and get rid of the whole matter once and for all. And so we had a whole series of, of hearings in Congress and Congress had to decide what they thought 
they were willing to pay the tribe in order to settle these cases. Uh, the Zuni, on the one hand, had the gamble that if it went to court, they might face a bad Supreme Court eventually and lose everything. They could, they could not get anything. The United States uh, worried that it would lose hundreds of millions of dollars. So somewhere in between was where Congress thought the answer should be. And eventually Congress determined that they would pay $50 million. Now at the time, I mean, the Zuni was poor. They were, the population was very poor. Uh, they, they, there was not high employment, at least of normal kind of jobs. Uh, and uh, so there was a big movement among people, among the general population to receive what were called per capita payments. And I had done enough, uh, enough research among other tribes decisions with the Indian Claims Commission to know that the usual, uh, what usually happened when there were per capita payments was that money went out to everybody on the reservation and they immediately went out and bought a new car and the people that really benefited were the car dealers that lived off the, that operated off the reservation. So I was pretty much opposed to a per capita payment idea. <clears throat> and eventually the council agreed with me that uh, they should, at least for half of the, the for, for Zuni too, as it came to be known, that was the, the eroded lands, the second case, that they would take half of the payment, 25 million, and uh, allow us to set up a trust fund. I wrote legislation uh, which allowed the estat, which called for the establishment of a $25 million trust fund. And the interest from that is to be used every year for repairing eroded lands and, and thus creating new agricultural lands. So we settled this in 1990 for $50 million and half of the money went into this trust fund. I'm happy to report that today, it's 30 years later, uh, there are three or 4,000 acres of, of agricultural land now in production at Zuni. And there'll be a, you know, a couple of hundred more acres every year until they're back to where they were once. If, that is, if their water adjudication works out as I'd like to see it. So uh, the uh, it was an amazing, uh, project. Uh, Zuni in 1968 was uh, provincial and insular. As I mentioned, they spoke Zuni as their first language. Uh, very few people spoke English. Uh, the tribal council, I had to have an inter interpreter because nobody on the council really spoke good English. The first step I had was to try and determine uh, it was easy to show that they did have a claim. What was less, what was more difficult was to show why they hadn't filed a claim by 1951. So going through the correspondence, I found uh, finally a letter dated on the exact date that the statute was to run, five years in 1951, and signed by the tribal council saying they didn't have a claim against the, the government. Well, this was a little bit suspicious to me that this would letter would get signed on the exact date that the statute ran. So I tracked down the person who had been the governor or tribal chairman of the tribe at that time <clears throat> and other members of the council. And they informed me that a representative of the, of the BIA had told them that if they filed a claim, the government, the United States would take their reservation away. Well, the Zunis, like a lot of other tribes, their reservation was the heart of their old ancestral lands. So uh, they, uh, in the, when the movement for termination went on, one of the arguments that was made was that uh, the uh, Indians had been placed on, in concentration camps. This was after the end of World War II. And this was a, a persuasive argument, which convinced many liberal Democrats uh, to support termination. I remember Frank, Ch I remember talking to Frank Church, the Democratic Senator from, from Idaho, who voted for termination because he thought reservations were 
were like concentration camps. The Indians, on the other hand, like Zuni, felt like this, this was the core of their ancestral lands. They, the last thing they wanted to lose was uh, the very heart of their traditional lands. So for, they had a very different perspective about it. But as I said, they were provincial and insular, and they had kept a lot of information secret. I remember one of the first, uh, when I started working on this, uh, doing my research for this case, the very first time I was invited by a family to dinner, uh, I remember it was a, a house with, with dirt floors. They didn't have wood floors and uh, nobody spoke English. <clears throat> so I was getting by as best I could and they served dinner and, and what it was, what it appeared to me, to me, they called it uh, mutton stew. They called it lamb stew, I think, but it was more like old mutton. And then there was bread from Horno's uh, beehive ovens. And <clears throat> there was, and there were just small amounts. There was just a small lo loaf of bread and, and there wasn't a lot of stew, but there was a fairly large bowl of what appeared to me to be string beans. And so I took a small amount of stew and a small amount of bread, and then I took a nice big helping of the string beans, which I quickly realized were actually jalapenos uh, cut into strips. And uh, I remember them looking at me as tears were running down my cheeks saying, oh, you really like those. <laughs> And so I figured I better, since I had served myself all that, I better finish it. But the point being, this this man came to be a kind of friend of mine, and he eventually described to me uh, how an interloper, a white interloper who had stolen a homestead, uh, a home of, of Zunis, and had taken their well, how the Zunis uh, murdered him. And he described in some detail uh, the manner in which the guy was killed. <clears throat> he also took me to a place where there was a, a, a very well-documented uh, gun battle between rustlers, white rustlers, and Zunis. And he was able to show me uh, where bullets bounced off rocks and where bullets hit Zunis and eventually where the some troops came from the United States and arrested the wrestlers after three or four Zunis were killed. Uh, and he could describe in great detail down to where bullets bounced off rocks and show me where the, the chips and the rocks still existed. So the value was that to me that they had maintained all these traditions and uh, still could pass them on, and they had been secret for all these years. On the other hand, because they were provincial and insular, there was a big uh, tendency to keep things secret and to not explain why things had happened as they had. So it was a difficult case, and I never did think that $50 million was enough for what had been taken from them. But from their point of view, it was the first real money they ever had, and they used it, uh, they used half of it mainly to buy back land that they had lost. So that there weren't very many per capita payments. The per capita payments, uh, I think, amounted to about five or 10 million out of the 50 million. So uh, in the end, uh, it was very productive, and they're, today they're uh, on their way to being. Uh, much more uh, to having much more employment and a much better economy than they had in the past. So uh, in determining the uh, lands uh, that were, the rule of the Indian Claims Commission was you had to show that lands were, that the tribe had, uh, had exclusive use and occupancy. The, the rule, the idea was that uh, tribes couldn't be sharing any land and the, the outcome in the court was that if there were ever any joint use areas, uh, the court would not pay any, anybody. 
so witnesses for the United States and witnesses for the tribes tended to agree. They were mostly anthropologists in the in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Uh, tended to agree on a line that sort of took joint use areas, uh, drew a line down the middle of them so that <clears throat> the tribes would share payment for them and somebody would get paid for all of the land. Uh, today, that's a, we, at Colville and elsewhere, the tribes really object to that because uh, <clears throat> they can show areas that were jointly used by several tribes and they point out that the tribes got along very well. Uh, and, <clears throat> and with the Colville tribes, some of these joint use areas, nobody did get paid for. So there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of uh, things that came out of the Indian Claims Commission, which uh, went against the tribes. On the other hand, uh, one of the things, uh, two, two important rights continue today as a result of determining Aboriginal title. Uh, one is uh, tribes now have the right to claim under the, under NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, uh, they have the right to claim to rebury the human remains of people that are found within their Aboriginal territory. And under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, <clears throat> tribes can claim uh, objects of cultural patrimony, it's called. I have often said that maybe they should have considered cult objects of cultural matri matrimony, but it's, it's a patrilineal government that we have. So, uh, for instance, if uh, a religious site is found or if, a, or if human remains are found where there are religious objects buried with the individual, then the tribe has a right to claim those uh, objects as well as the, to rebury the human remains. Uh, where Section 106 came to play <coughs> with us in the valley, here in the Meta Valley, there are two cases recently. Uh, one was the uh, what they called the high altitude helicopter training site that they were going to establish up by Mazama, and uh, the tribe pointed out that that had been traditionally a an area under Section 106, uh, an area that was used for vision quests by the Medhel people, and uh, so they objected to the establishment of any kind of construction within that area. They used a similar argument uh, opposed to the mining company, the Canadian Mining Company, which was uh, planning on constructing the copper mine above Mazama. They said, you know, that uh, we had documented uh, through interviews. In fact, I had done interviews with people 25 years, 30 years ago, uh, who identified that area as a vision site area long before there was any word of any mine to be established up there. And uh, the tribe threatened to sue <clears throat> if that uh, mine was allowed to proceed. I always thought that that uh, action of the tribe was very helpful in, in stopping that mine. So uh, today, there are a couple of other minor kinds of uh, rights that uh, tribes can uh, can initiate uh, litigation in regard to as a result of the establishment of Aboriginal boundaries. It did because what ha another thing that happened was when a tribe didn't file a land claim or when it had a poor representation or simply wouldn't come up with evidence. And sometimes in being insular and provincial would lead them to do that. Uh, in those cases, other tribes might take advantage of the situation and claim a larger area than they actually used. And that has led to difficulties today, intertribal uh, disputes <clears throat> that probably wouldn't have existed uh, traditionally. Uh, 
so under, as I was gathering evidence, uh, one of the hardest things to determine was the extent of religious use. Uh, that was when we talk about a tribe being insular and provincial, uh, one of the last things they want to expose or reveal to the non-Indian public is their religious activities, their religious sites. And uh, you, even today, like at Colville, uh, frequently, I over the years, mostly in previous years, I've been called out to look at uh, potential burial sites. And uh, I had a couple of ranchers in this area who have said they've come across burials and wanted to determine if they really were tribal burials. And the tribe's response is uh, to not to try and not call any attention to that. Uh, they their belief is that there will be more looting uh, if sites are identified, and it's best to just simply leave them alone. So they will tend now to take a GPS reading where the location is. If it's around any habitation, they'll fence it. But otherwise, they tend to just leave it alone and, and not try and call any attention to the to the burial sites. So uh, religious use, burial sites, some of these things were really difficult to document. In the end, uh, uh, we were able to establish the religious use area. We had maps showing religious use, uh, gathering, digging of plants uh, and gathering. Uh, grazing. Uh, after the Pueblo Revolt in 1680, the tribes acquired a lot of sheep, uh, and uh, so they had large herds of sheep in the mid-19th century. <clears throat> uh, the Zuni, like a lot of other Pueblos, did not acquire, didn't take to the horse. They viewed the horses uh, competing with them for food sources, so they didn't really like to have a lot of horses around. Uh, except for warfare, and there were they did keep uh, mounts for uh, their militia. Uh, so we had we had maps showing agriculture, uh, gathering, religious use, uh, and grazing, and uh, when you superimposed all of these, there was uh, an area that was about twelve million acres that was pretty difficult to dispute. I remember that the United States at one time tried to argue that part of this was Navajo territory and they uh, cited about 20 documents that, sh that in which somebody had identified Navajos as being in this area. So I went back and I went looked at every one of the documents, many of which were of course in Spanish, and uh, was able to determine that in every single case, uh, the Navajos were being chased out of the area, either by U.S. troops or by Zuni militia. So that argument didn't work too well. Uh, the uh, I wanted to say a couple of more words about the uh, the uh, Zuni Mountain. So. What we had to do with that was we were able to show the first argument was the United States, the United States argued that uh, it was not responsible for the cut, clear cutting of the mountains. And so I was able to define the, uh, actually the records of the lumber company that did the cutting and show that the principal owners were the, uh, the military leaders at Fort Wingate, and uh, we had a section by section anal uh, analysis of cutting, uh, and they were doing it for profit for profit reasons to show their profit. Uh, <clears throat> but it worked very well for us because we were able to show the erosion tied with the uh, cutting. The erosion increased as the cutting increased, and then when we had sheep and cattle going over it. Uh, we also showed the records of the military commanders who owned the sheep and owned the cattle. Uh, and as I said, we uh, 
we did dendrochronological studies showing how much uh, how much uh, the climate changed, how much rainfall there was each year, and that the rainfall could not be shown to be responsible for the unusual cycle of uh, erosion because the same cycles of rainfall had occurred many, many times in the past without any erosion. I, we had a big series of depositions in Albuquerque one year. And in anticipation of that, I made up t-shirts that showed Harley motorcycles on the front and on the back said cycles, Zuni cycles. Uh, and uh, <laughs> all of our witnesses wore these to the depositions. The Justice Department was scratching it. The attorneys were scratching their heads wondering what this was all about. Uh, so uh, in 1990, we finally uh, settled these cases for uh, $50 million. As I said, I didn't think it was enough, but that was as much as Congress was willing to pay. So I was hoping there would be a few questions or comments. I have an odd question. This is Sheila. Okay, Sheila. Did the Zuni give you a name in their language? Yes, they had a couple of names for me. <laughs> uh, initially, they called me, uh, they had a Zuni name for a fast rabbit. And then later on, they, they named me for a slow tortoise <laughs> as I grew up older. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Yeah. But, uh, my son, one of my son's names was Onothlikyatsana, which is uh, a, a certain kind of a species of bird a little species of bird, but now they call him Flana, which is a big species of bird. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, they, they named almost everybody all the time, traditionally. Yeah. Uh, some of the anthropologists we learned had not gotten the correct interpretation for their names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I won't repeat. <laughs> they probably earned it too. Yeah. So I have a question. When, oh. when was that clear cutting? I missed that date. The clear cutting uh, the began in the 1890s, and the sheep and the cattle carried on through uh, the early 20th century, about to about 1910. Uh, the United States believed Zuni had a a system of, of irrigation called floodwater irrigation. So yes. uh, they pray almost every day uh, for rain. Uh, and I mentioned birds and bird feathers. They, they, the traditional leaders all know all the species of birds that ever show up at any point in the year. And Whenever they pray, they plant what they call are pieces of wood about as long as uh, from their fingertip to their elbow, and they're painted. And on the end of them, they have tied uh, feathers from various birds. Uh, and depending on what the prayer is for, will depend on what feathers there are. They identify primary flight feathers and down, and secondary flight feathers. Uh, as I said, I think. Uh, we had an ethno-ornithologist who identified 80 different species of birds that they used for prayer feathers, for prayer sticks. Uh, so uh, they, uh, one of the things, another thing that we did was uh, we used uh, an expert who had, who was expert in photogrammetry so we had, uh, because of Zuni being very picturesque, in the, especially in the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, there was a lot of photography done and we had thousands of photographs at our disposal. And many of them showed the stream channels 
in their native state in the 19th century and as they eroded and as they became fully eroded. Uh, the, uh, as I said, the United States didn't believe that uh, traditional Zuni uh, irrigation was a, a civilized method of growing plants. And so they tried to get the Indians to uh, stop doing that. Uh, the at Zuni, if it rained, as I said, everybody prayed for rain almost every day. So if it rained, everybody went outside in the rain. After I moved to Seattle a long time later, I decided I wasn't going to stay inside when it rained. I wasn't going to feel bad if it was raining. Having known people for decades who always went outside and smiled whenever it rained. <laughs> so the way they approached uh, irrigation was if it was raining, they went out and moved the water uh, as it rained and they moved the floodwaters uh, wherever there was a stream bed in Arroyo, they would uh, build little check dams and move the water into the cornfields and into the, the rows of other specialty plants that they were growing. The United States decided that uh, not only was this a bad form, but that the way that should be done is through canals and dams. And so they, the, there were only two real tributaries on the reservation, the Zuni River and the Nutria River, which is misnamed. It was Beaver, it wasn't Nutria. And so they built a dam called Black Rock Dam and they built it in the years 2000 to 2006. And uh, what happened was it immediately silted in to 90% of the capacity of water and then it breached, which uh, caused even more erosion. So there was a lot, it was more complicated than I, my overview showed you, but uh, the United States over and over again took the wrong, the wrong, made the wrong decisions. And part of it is from never respecting the Zuni ma manner of managing its resources. Uh, just one more example of how Zuni managed its resources. Uh, Zuni's traditional system of operation was the uh, men, oper men controlled the priesthoods and the what we call the executive arm of the government, the police or the military, the militia. Women controlled all property rights through the clans. So the matriarchs had complete control over use rights for agricultural fields and for grazing fields uh, and for even gathering areas. The United States officials early in the 20th century thought this was really terrible that women would be given so much power. And so they arbitrarily identified a bunch of, uh, I think it was 18 or 20 old men and, and appointed them as the guardians uh, or quasi owners of uh, grazing areas and agricultural areas. And to this day, there's still conflicts between the clans and the BIA people about who owns various fields. Although I think the clans have, have won most of those battles at this point. So. Mm -hmm. Jim had his hand up earlier, so I just want to be sure he has a chance to ask. I was curious, Richard, uh, tw 12 million acres is a, is a huge amount of land. It's like 20,000 sections. Uh, I'm curious as to what was the, the, the proximate boundaries of that area. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit familiar with that part of the, of the state. And so I'm just curious as to how much, what kind of, what kind of was kind of the limits of their, their movements. Okay, so the uh, in the south they went almost they went down to you know where Springerville St. John's are. Mm -hmm. they, went down and they included that area. They included a lot of the uh, Little Colorado drainage, the Upper Little Colorado drainage. Uh, we uh, uh, we had a number of lawsuits. There were these the claims cases split into several other pieces of litigation. So there were there was a water case involving the Little Colorado. 
and there were religious use rights also for part of that area. One of the things that Zinnies had to do at the initial, when we finally, when we filed the, the original lawsuits, uh, we told them the United States is going to treat this like a quiet title case. So if you, if there are places where you believe that you could never ever sell the area or never receive compensation for it, any religious site that you think is that important, you should exclude it. And so they excluded two areas. One was Kotlawalawa, which is the area where they believe they go after death. And the other was uh, Zuni Salt Lake, which is about 30, 40 miles directly south of Zuni. So the Zuni, I forget the name of the mountains that kind of flow along the border of the Mexican border. Zuni's territory went down to those mountains. There's a big, huge wow. plain in to the south of Zuni. And in the middle of that is Zuni Salt Lake, which is a, uh, a volcanic mar. Uh, their lands to the east went as far as the Malpai. Uh, I don't wow. know if you remember Malpai National Monument mm -hmm. uh, and El Moro. It went over that far. El yeah. Moro was a spring that they controlled uh, if you were coming from Santa Fe or, or Albuquerque, uh, I think it was the last water source before Zuni. Uh, to the north, uh, it went almost, almost up to Mount Taylor, to the west. And it, so they abutted, their lands abutted with Hopi and with Laguna. Uh, and to the south, uh, with Apache, with the White Mountain Apache. Uh, so the, uh, the Spaniards viewed the Pueblo Corridor as, if, if you can imagine at the time, they, the Navajo were above the Pueblo Corridor and the Apaches were below the Pueblo Corridor, which is one of the reasons why the, the Spanish uh, and then Mexicans uh, armed the Pueblos because it was, they were important to ally. I could pull out a map. I'm sorry, I don't have a map ready to show you the extent. No, that's Maybe. fine. That's, that that's very helpful. Yeah, that's very helpful. It's quite large. So, so what we did was we, we actually did a township by township analysis, which amounted to section by section to show when title was first transferred to anybody for any purpose. Uh, and uh, the United States was unable to show that it controlled. If you can hold, I'm, I'm going to grab a map that I can at least hold up in front of you. Hold on just one second. Why did my picture just go off? I've got a problem here. I've been muting and unmuting. This is a map of the Zuni claim area. The gray part is the Zuni reservation as it exists today. And the different colors represent different times of taking. Wow. So 